Welcome to the Jenkins User Experience Special Interest Group. It's the 16th of February, 2022. Thanks for being here. So topics that I see on the agenda, weekly status, um, an issue that Daniel Beck raised about image removal and existing plugins. Then we've had good sessions with Jan, Jan and Tim sharing ongoing UI improvements. Uli added Prism for source code highlighting and Font Awesome and Code Coverage plugin. Uh, Jan, would you be okay if I moved UI improvements to the end so that we've got the most time available there? Sure, oh, that sounds great. Okay, and Uli, are you okay if I do it that way? That's fine. Great, okay. Any other topics that need to go on our agenda today? Okay, then first topic, 235, the 2.335 weekly status. As far as I understand, the build is in progress. I've seen entries written to uh, tags, written to the, or not tags, artifacts written to Artifactory. Uh, I haven't run the release checklist to be sure that all the parts and pieces are done. Uh, this is the one that switches the Linux installer to system D from system five in it to system D. That's not a U, UI thing per se, but it is user experience. And so I'm using that as the excuse to note it here. I intend to blog about that um, because I think it's a big deal. Um, and I've got to make an update to the change log. Any questions on 2.335? Okay. Next topic then was there was a concern I saw from Daniel Beck in terms of the image removal, the, the removal of icons may break some long existing plugins. I wanted to get, get input from people in the UX SIG. Is there something we should do about this? How would, how would we approach it, et cetera? Wouldn't be the easiest thing to file a bug report and fix the plugin. <laughs> so I don't see a real problem with this because you know, I think we need to go forward with the UI and this means that we will break things. So if something is not really working yet, we can provide a pull request and these pull requests are quite easy. Maybe just a different URL for the images. Is I it something things... we can yeah, go on, please? Sorry. Um, I think one of the things kind of going forward is plugins will want to update their icons anyway. Um, if they want to fit in with the new style of Jenkins icons, they'll probably update by themselves. So it shouldn't be too much of an issue. Um, yeah, it's just down to removing old images at the moment. The BRE race on was something that affected that too. Like Tim? Just in case, Tim, your mic is not uh, the expected one, I think. Yeah, we're not hearing. Uh, sorry, I'm not hearing you. I, I get some hints that you, you're saying something. Try that. Yes, Perfect. much better. Oh, I'm just having a nightmare with my headphones. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> maybe that works now. Um, I was just saying that he the PR he raised on was something that only affected like two plugins. Ah, uh, okay. Which, yeah, I thought it was a bit over the top, the comment. Okay. All right. Well, so so the it sounds like the consensus is then. Well, or Vadek, you had a comment before we go on. Yeah, just about the the response there that the pull requests are easy and things like this. Uh, I agree completely with that. My concern is mainly for private plugin. There are a lot of users of Jenkins that are implementing their own plugins, and in that case, they do not have the knowledge about what you know in terms of what is easy, what they have to do and this kind of thing. So it could be a bit more painful to do for them, the different updates that are required there. So is it possible to have a separate plugin with the legacy icon, with the good uh, links and this kind of thing so that they can keep using their own private plugin with that legacy adapter transformer plugin in a sense? I'm not sure how easy it would work because the plugins, the images that are being removed are from core, not from plugins. 
uh, and they're coming from the core resource path. Um, there is a migration guide published for any of these on how to adapt. And so it should be self-discovery there normally? In the sense that if I imagine I have a private plugin, I'm using some links that are no longer available in the new version of Jenkins. Will I get the information that there is a migration guide somewhere? Like some uh, 404 page with information, hey, you can look at that migration path, this kind of thing, or it just, you have to guess, you have to create an issue to look for the things in the website. Just thinking about the developer experience there as well. Yeah, it's just Jenkins.io and there'll be an LTS upgrade guide as well, I assume. Yeah, see, and, and we usually do the LTS upgrade guide to focus towards users. So this one might be somewhat of an exception than if we put it in the LTS upgrade guide saying, hey, look, this, this is part of UI modernization and go help modernize your, your, plug, your private plugins. Yeah, so users of private plugins may need to update their image location. See the migration guide. Okay, so fine. Forget about what I said. That's good. <laughs> yeah, Is... I mean, go ahead. Tim. You could you could possibly add in a hook for well, like um, what Wadek said. Um, if it's one of those removed ones, then show a special image or something. Um, but it'd have to be quite small and probably still return 404 and link to the, but you wouldn't be able to link it or anything. Like, it just sure opened the it. discussion if you had some thought, like it was easy to do or things like that. If it's not the case, not, uh, not worth the effort, I would say. Uh, I don't think so really, uh, but thanks for raising it. Okay. So, so good insight. So um, I think I'm back to the consensus being, we would prefer to have plugin maintainers repair it, make the changes and use, use the migration guide as their, as their guidance on how to do it. Is there a way that I could search through the Jenkins open source code base and see the plugins that need migration? I assume there is, right? That we could, that, that's a searchable thing. Mm, Alex already handled most of it. Oh, he did. So he's, okay, he, all right. He, he migrated. He, so for the, for the main, for the, there was two PRs. There was the main one that removed three hundred icons or whatever, and Alex updated about fifty plugins or so and got them all released. Um, and then there was the one that you saw that Daniel commented on, which affects like two plugins. Got it. Okay. So so the the open source piece, the non private plugins. Has has already been done, and and yes, it was a known known thing. It could be done. Thanks. Yeah, and the, there may be a couple of edge cases. I think Alex has done a few follow ups since it was released, but the big majority of them was handled in before it was released. Okay. All right. So I think we're back to the consensus: is uh, let's continue submitting pull requests and documenting. And point to the migration guide for plugins with icon issues with old icons and point to the migration guide. Did I, is that a fair enough statement? Yeah. Okay, great. Next topic then was Prism for source code highlighting, Uli. Do you want me to stop sharing my screen and we'll let you share your screen to show or? Yeah, maybe that's the best thing. It's just uh, yeah, a minute or two slow, but it's easier to see it on screen, I think. Okay, so let me stop sharing. Where is the stop share? There it is, okay, got it. So um, let's, uh, one moment. Um, so last year, I think I introduced the new plugin that uh, can yeah, highlight source code and basically 
sorry, I'm using it in the warnings plugin to render the source code. So here is one example in, in uh, one of my warnings plugin views where you will see the source code of a yeah of a warning and you see here the warning highlighted. And what I'm using here in the background is the Prism plugin now, which is rendering the source code using yeah, JavaScript. Um, what I uh, this was part of the warnings plugin, and now I created from this part of the warnings plugin a new plugin where, where other plugins can use it. So, for instance, I would like to use it in the code coverage plugin, and maybe some other plugins can use it as well. What I created now is uh, I extracted all of these uh, colorings uh, into this plugin. So it depends on the language you're using. So if you are rendering C code, it will use a C code renderer. If you're using Java code, you can see the rendering or the highlighting with Java. So this is done automatically. What I also added is a kind of a system configuration. So we have here the Prism syntax highlighting section. And here you can select the theme. So currently, these are all these themes that are supported by Prism. Maybe there are some additional ones available, but these are the ones I found on the plugin repository of Prism. And you can select the plugin. And if you choose a different theme, then the rendering will look different. So you can use, if you have a dark theme, you can use this one. If you have a light theme, you can this one. That it depends what you prefer. Um, currently, it is only possible to configure it in the system configuration. Uh, what I'm going to add is to make it uh, customizable per user. So a user can say, OK, I have a dark theme or a light theme. Yeah, that would be easier if it can be changed per user. And it would even be not much easier if we can change it automatically, but I'm not sure how to do this to get an event if the yeah, system is using a light theme. So in, on macOS, you can switch and toggle. I'm not sure if I can catch these events and handle it in Jenkins. So basically, yeah. The plugin is yeah not really a, a special thing. It just provides Prism JS for Jenkins plugins. So, are there any questions on this plugin or ideas what to do? A couple of things, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. It'd be cool if it was integrated into Theme Manager in some way, so that all the theme configuration was in one place. Yeah. You probably need, probably need a new extension point in Theme Manager for mm -hmm. you to be able to add your own theme settings. Yeah, that would um, be a good idea. Yeah. yeah. And the other is, yeah, we had, we had a bit of a look at adding it for configuration as code, but I think it seemed just a bit heavy because configuration as code tried to avoid dependencies a lot. I think it had a few dependencies like plugin util and. Yeah. Um, a couple others, so we're not sure. I think thinking about it, um, but I think because because part of it is, is it has a whole bunch for generating your generating it on Java code side, whereas in configuration as code, we're just enriching a YAML file. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we, were, we were the two things we were interested in it for was one a managed version of Prism API, so we didn't manage it ourselves, and the other one was the theme side of it. Um, but yeah, I'm just not sure if it's the best fit for that plug for the configurations code plugin. Um, but we we were interested in that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can split this plugin in one, yeah, JS part and the uh, util part or something like that. I'm not sure. Yeah, that would certainly help. Mm -hmm. So so Uli, the the Prism API plugin today is is more than just the JavaScript. The, the Prism JavaScript library. I see. Yeah. Okay. Actually, it provides uh, this view. Ah. So the idea is that if you change, uh, well, yeah, if a lot of plugins are using the same view, uh, I don't need to reprogram these views. And if I want to change it, I need it to change it only in one place. So mm. the idea is like the Bootstrap plugin. We have 
the Java scripting library and some add-ons we can already use in Java. So yeah, of course we can split all of these plugins in a simple JS layer where we only have the Java scripting part and the additional ones which provide some jelly views and provide some Java APIs. So currently all of these plugins contain Java code to help the Java developers. Mm. Yeah, and if someone yeah, just needs the Java scripting libraries, it's not possible yet to split them. Got it. It's just a matter of work. <laughs> so I want to don't have so much time as so all I have one component, but yeah, it would be possible to use two components for that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Any other questions on this topic? So maybe then I switch to the next uh, UI plugin, which is uh, just a note that we, uh, I also have a plugin which provides the icons of font uh, awesome. Um, they have now a release six with a lot of new icons and a lot of new designs. And I included these new icons now in the yeah corresponding Jenkins plugin. So if someone would like to use icons, which are not the Tango icons, but some uh, looking better ones. Uh, yeah, everybody can use the new ones of the 6.0 version of a font awesome. So and is it, do I go to the plugin documentation on plugins.jenkins.io to learn more about how to use those? Or is there some other place I need to go to? Yeah, it's uh, all, I think it's in the GitHub repository, everything. Uh, so it's a, a big readme. And I think I, I wrote a blog post uh, yeah, a couple of years, I don't know, <laughs> where I introduced all these uh, Jenkins uh, Java scripting libraries. And I wrote a lot of uh, yeah, examples on how to use them, basically. So yeah. So the plugin, this plugin is really simple. It just provides the icons as a sprite, and you can use them in your plugins. So if we have all uh, Ionic icons in Jenkins core, uh, maybe this one is not needed anymore. But until then, yeah, maybe it's a good alternative for Tango icons. So I'm using it, for instance, here in, in the spot box plugin here on this, uh, or here on this side, where you can yeah have some nice icons without, yeah, without any configuration, you just simply use the name and you can use it. And this is what I also mentioned on our pull request of Jan. Um, so as a plugin author, I just want to use icons. I don't want to search in the internet for an icon and don't want to upload it in my plugin. I just want to use them. So this is the idea behind this plugin. And yeah, maybe we, can, we have a similar a concept in core sometimes, then this plugin is not needed anymore. Okay. And the last thing I would like to show you is, you know, it's more uh, to get some feedback what we can do. Uh, one of my students is currently uh, working in the code coverage uh, plugin to improve the yeah, code coverage views. And we are currently um, uh, trying to incorporate a column in the main view or in this uh, table where you see the code coverage. And I, I'm, you know, we are not designers, so uh, I want to have an open question uh, on what would make sense to show in a column the code coverage. So currently uh, we are using the percentage here of the code coverage and a color. And the color has a yeah, a shading or how do you say it in English? Uh, a gradient uh, where it you more it's more green if you have a higher uh, coverage, and it will go sometimes to red. So, but it, it doesn't really look like a nice <laughs> with a new table. So I'm not sure if someone has an idea how we can improve such views or such cells here. 
Have you oui. tried using some labels, tags, the things that are just around with the background around the number? Like you can see on uh, notification uh, pills in general, with the exactly the same kind of color you have there, with some red thing if it's below 20 or things like that. You yeah. have the information about the color, you have the number, but you are not fooling, filling the, the cell completely in terms of background. You mean here, like the one here in the... Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh -huh. I, like a I would... mm -hmm. Yeah. Couple, couple of things. I would drop percentage from the label of the column. It goes on two lines and it's pretty yeah, obvious okay. percent because it has a percent. Um, mm -hmm. And do you need that not applicable color there? Which I guess you're possibly trying to call out there's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but... It, whether it's intended that all the projects have coverage, yeah. I would possibly just leave it uncolored. Yeah. What I've seen is uh, maybe this is a, a totally different example on the, uh, sorry, let's see. Uh, when you look at uh, code cuff, who is the tool which, which showed the coverage. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I thought that we can see it here. Okay, it doesn't work now. Okay, sorry. Um, so they provide uh, a background which is a kind of um, yeah fifty percent of the background is filled and fifty percent is not filled and this shows a coverage of fifty percent. Maybe this is an idea, which is not so. Yeah, currently it is. Yeah, the colors are too looking too high uh, with high contrast and I think it it doesn't really look ni nice currently. Okay. But maybe that's a good idea to use some batches or something like that. Uh -huh. okay. uh, to, to go further on Tim's theme, I wonder if, if the word were just coverage at the top, let them infer a code. Mm. Yes, of course. And this is, uh, I don't care. The label still doesn't, is okay. That's, uh, I already commented that on the pull request, but uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how to the cells should look like. Because in the static analysis plugins, I have uh, uh, the same thing. So yeah, okay, this is uh, a different thing that our tooltips don't uh, look uh, good. Um, and how? Yeah, show how can I show uh, a, that a project has too much warnings, or if the warnings are okay, something like that. We have it in in different. Uh, ways it's the number of tests uh, the code coverage the number of warnings etc i think yeah we don't show only text we sometimes it makes sense to show some more information on a, on the screen so it would be helpful if we have some concept that can be reused somehow mm -hmm. okay so this is just an impression um i keep you informed how we are proceeding here and just to put some positive note, it's a very nice thing to have. So uh, move on there, it's very useful to have such information. So uh, mm -hmm. great job. Thanks. Okay. Are there any additional questions? Okay. Then I think I'm finished with my part. All right. So next, I think next topic then was was. Jan and Tim on uh, UI improvements or current status. Jan, do you want to take over? And if you've got something you'd like to share or topics mm -hmm. you'd like to discuss? Sure, um, I'll just share my screen quickly. Um, nothing major today. Um, just a quick update on where we are really. Um, so kind of in the last week or two, um, we've had the forms stuff merged in um so hopefully you can see that um it's basically 90 odd percent of form components across jenkins are now using the new stylings um so things are a little bit more consistent now they have the same kind of focus states and colors and whatnot um so this was this is quite a pain getting in so thanks everyone for the help um it is really appreciated um so that's that's now merged um, there's going to be a fair few follow-up uh, merge requests to this just to update the odd thing. Um, 
such as the draggable cards, they'll probably change eventually and stuff like that. Um, very recently, the new um, icons have been merged in. So users can now use the symbols across Jenkins. Um, as seen on the settings page, everything's using the same kind of simple icon, basically. It's, it's quite flat and so on. Um, looks like so. Um, and then recently, I've been working on updating the rest of the icons across Jenkins. Um, so you'll see in the sidebar, using the same style of icons, um, the RSS icons updated, um, the little pencil, um, but also recently updated the kind of status and weather icons. Um, they look a little oh, bit... That, that weather icon will get people excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're, they're a little bit different to how the ion icons look at the moment, but this is kind of work in progress. Um, so everything's a little bit kind of flatter, a little bit bolder, um, and the weather icons have their kind of distinctive colours back. Um, There's a, so. a lot of people who <laughs> complained about the weather colours, weather icons going to a single colour. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it for me, really. Just working on the new icons at the moment. Um, we'll hopefully have some sort of pull request up soon. Um, that's that's all for me, really. Does anybody have any questions or anything? So, so is this the large view? Could you? Yeah, this is the, the large view for the icons. And so, those are the they are are they are they significantly smaller than they were before, or is it? Um, am I just misremembering? Is is my recollection poor in terms of size of icon compared to text? I don't think so, um, but I could definitely increase them. Um, in size, if if they are too small. Um, no, no. As I as I look at them now, I think I think you got it matched. I just I had not remembered them being as well suited to the size of the text. Nice. Um, it's, it's, it's probably good to have a selection of jobs with different statuses to show if, when demoing this sort of thing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, just a message from Daniel just saying to open up. Oh, sorry. Ci.jenkins.io. Yeah, my browser's oh, oh. just gone berserk. <laughs> um, because we only have folders on the top level, but if you select the job that's building on the left, perhaps. Uh, um, they, they do look a little bit small. I think they may have changed size when the table was redesigned. Um, just CI Jenkins isn't running the, the newer version yet. Um, so they probably are a touch smaller than than this, yeah. Feel more obvious with more jobs, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions or anything? Rob, stupid question. I really like that new set of icon, but at the same time, there were a lot of changes in terms of icon that were done what, uh, two years ago, something like that, in the first kind of rewomp of uh, icons. Mm -hmm. What could be the, the guideline in general when we want to change something like this to prevent someone to rechange back, in a sense, in one year or things like that, to be sure we are coordinating the effort in the good direction all together instead of having multiple conflicting directions, in a sense? Mm -hmm. I think that, that project just got abandoned. It was at the very end of the cloud based UX improvements and it was it was the very last thing that was being worked on basically um but yeah, um, i'm not saying yeah, it yeah, should yeah, be yeah. followed completely it just that approach i prefer that approach completely it just what could be done to prevent this kind of uh, situation in a sense um i mean jan's published a um kind of a design sort of guide onto jenkins.io i think has it, been, has it been merged jan do you remember uh don't think so or, quite yet. i think it, actually i think it was waiting for the weekly today right. so it should probably be merged after the weekly um but yeah jan's put up a guide on how to use these anyway um as a starting point okay great perfect 
I was um, just about to ask what happened to the style guide documentation plugin developer thing that I asked for last year. And this is the first time hearing about this. So I'm really excited. Thank you. Yeah, it's, there's a PR ready to go. It was just waiting for the to-do version to be filled in. Got held back because of the security release last week. I was already been out before. Um. Kind of somewhat on that topic as well. I've recently, like very recently, just forked the UI samples project um, just to try and update that a little bit. Um, oh, nice. Kind of looks like it's completely very, very rough, but the idea is that we'll have a kind of page for every component um, just so developers can kind of pop on here and copy code and so on, get the right kind of templates yeah. and plug in and so on. We um, talked about this yeah. a year or two ago about either just moving this back into core or um or automatically installing it somehow in test jenkinses or something mm -hmm. just because it's, it's a lot of people don't even know it exists because it's just some random plugin um and because it's outside of core it's a lot harder for people to maintain it mm -hmm. So, so um, Jan, could you pick one of those? This looks this this gives me real hope. I I was amazed at the number of things that surprised me, and and so this lets me now explore with the UI samples plugin and mm -hmm. see source code to get a hint. Yeah, you should get you should get jelly card as well. Yeah, um, but I want to kind of restructure the pages anyway. Um, maybe offer examples of both Groovy and Jelly at the same time, rather than having them kind of split um mm. but yeah um so for example the copy button page um shows you the preview of the component they can also access the source code for it um yeah it's kind of a really early days for cover at the moment so we'll see yeah. maybe for the next um sig to see where see where it goes there yeah and it'd, and it'd be the... cool, cool if you could inline that so you don't have to click on the source file if you mm -hmm. could just do some sort of raw thing with a prism, um, does that <laughs> uh, prism highlighting on top of it or something? That'd be cool. So, so, and copy button in this case is showing the groovy. Is there a copy button jelly that's that's the same thing in jelly, and that's what you would combine two things into one? Yeah, um, there isn't a jelly version yet, but I can yeah. just write that quite quickly. Um, yeah. And now for as guidance for me, I think most people are preferring to write jelly. Is there a is there a a, a reason we should be pushing more and more people? Should should the Git plugin, for instance, switch from the things where it's using Groovy now in its UI to use jelly? Is there a is there are there weaknesses in using Groovy that I should be aware of? If you're using jelly, it simplified the work of the security team. Ah, okay. Just for Thank that, you. it could be a good argument because Product. if you want, when we are looking for things in Jenkins, if you are using a completely different language, it's just completely different for us to look for your thing in general. So if I can, with a magic wand, to change all the Groovy view to Jelly, I will do it in an instant because Got for it. us, it's just doubling the size in terms of uh, result, uh, rules to write, this kind of thing. So. Yeah. Jelly views are supposed to be more performant. So anything that gets called an awful lot is supposed to be in Jelly. Uh, Groovy is supposed to have better IDE integration and you can debug your views in the IDE. Um, it's an advantage of it, but I kind of also, I've always found the Groovy a bit harder to write. Great, thank you. Okay, so that that lobbies that there are that moving away from Groovy is a good thing, and showing people like me how to do it with Jelly will be a help. Great, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think I think Groovy is supposed to be more type safe views, and a little bit anyway. The better IDE support, I think, is one of the poles, but. I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen then, if that's all right. Um, cool. Cheers, everyone. I've got, I've got the um, theme manager um, rework. Um, so this is something that Jan started on earlier. Let me just find my screen. Um, so yeah, Jan started this a while back, um, but it kind of just left it because it depended on the form rework. Um, but so you might've seen this before, you will have seen 
that he's changed the built-in themes from um, uh, just little radio buttons on the side here to actually separate them out into a theme. And then he's got like pulled in the colors from each theme and then it shows you um, which theme it is. Um, and then if you click on it, it will actually change. So if I click to default, it will live reload and change to nothing. Same with dark and dark system. And then if I go to, um, display, dark mode. So I've just changed my display from light to dark mode. Um, and then solarize, solarize dark. It's all just like live clicking around here. Um, so yeah, hopefully that is something that people like, but I think it should be quite nice. That's awesome. Um, okay, so so my user experience is I can click around and see what the theme will, how the theme will appear to me if I choose that. Yeah. Oh. Very nice job on the animation as well. <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> done nothing to do that. <laughs> I just I just changed a CSS class, uh, not even CSS, a data set. So it's based on this value up here. Um, themes are now namespaced. So it's a bit of a design change. So instead of only serving one CSS file, it serves all of the CSS files on the pages. Um, and then based on this value here, um, it's which theme it's going to show. And, and so now does this dramatically increase page size for people or? The CSS files are absolutely tiny. Ah, okay, um, so not, not really an issue. So if I refresh, the solarized ones are under a kilobyte and the dark theme ones are about 11 kilobyte each and they will be cached heavily once I fix the dark theme, not caching stuff. Whereas I see that Daniel used stapler in a better way. Um, yeah, there's one bug to fix on the solarized system. As you see, solarized system isn't working and I need to change something in core um, to integrate with this so that it gets the default color instead of the currently selected one. Um, but it's pretty much there. Um, the main, I'll show you just a couple of main changes just for theme authors. Um, oh, that's on my fork. Um, so there's a new flag is namespaced. So this, this will only add all the themes if they're namespaced. So old themes won't automatically get added to this. Um, so it means you won't get any problem with an old, and it's, it's completely compatible. Um, and old themes won't affect this new setup. Um, I've done a bit of a hack in the dark theme. Um, when I load the file, I add this prefers colors theme dark. Um, rather than how the other mechanism was before. Um, so there's just a couple of places in it automatic. And so it just does a final replacement of that as well. Changes it to dark systems. So I've only got one CSS file. Um, it's a bit hacky. Um, but you see all these, these data theme equals dark selectors. That's selecting the root elements theme. Um, and you'll also see the theme picker has a data theme element as well on it. Uh, so that's how I've got the um, colors coming in here. So it's just it's just using in the SVG, it uses the same variables that are used for um, that the theme uses. And then this here is a more specific selector, which overrides um, in the context of this window. Um, and so yeah, I've got a local fork of um, the solarized one, um, which is pretty much the same thing. Um, and I'll yeah, so I'll try fix up Solarize to work on system as well, and probably update material theme and core. But I think it's pretty much there. It's pretty close to ready. I pushed, so I updated Yarn's pull request and theme manager. Um, there's one thing that is failing is the injected test fails because it doesn't allow you to do four equals on the label. So Yarn switched from 
attached previous to four equals, but, but I think Jenkins core also switched from that, but Jenkins core doesn't run injected tests. Um, so I think we might just need to make, update the remove that injected test probably. Um, you, you said four equals, Tim, that has some semantic meaning in JavaScript that. Yeah, so it associates a, a label to an input using the ID. Um, you weren't allowed to do it before because of, um, well, it's, it was to discourage you to do it because repeatable elements and rep and guessable IDs wasn't so easy, but that's all handled for you inside of the um, jelly fragments. Um, so inside of radio, F radio or whatever it is, it generates the ID for you and does the association. Whereas before there was a um, JavaScript function called which attached, which would try and find these and attach them. But I assume Yarn changed that for some reason. Is it didn't work perfectly in some cases, I'm guessing? It's mainly just for accessibility. Um, and then some of the CSS lectures kind of got a bit wonky with that method. Um, so it kind of went a bit weird, but pretty much that, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. just need to fix that up because the tests are failing because of that at the moment. But hopefully should have all that tidied up either this this week or next. It's pretty close to being ready. And uh, for me, I have a question about uh, for plugins. Uh, so uh, what I'm using in my plugins is a kind of color palette to show the warnings or to show the coverage. And I think that it would be perfectly if we integrate an extension point so plugins can provide a themable thing. And then I can have different colors if we have, for instance, a black theme and currently the colors are look a little bit weird uh, on the charts if we use the same colors in a dark theme. So we can automatically switch them. So that would, would be a really good thing if it would be extensible. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you could, you could certainly get the themes from Theme Manager already and you could just use the, I'm not sure if you could just map those themes or Mm -hmm. or just see or another extension point to integrate with in some way but like you could look up the theme and if you could see it was using dark you could um or dark system or something you could just use that yeah but the themes are have no semantics or they have just a name mm. yeah i mean it should it would definitely be possible to add a extension point to for it that a plugin can extend from theme manager yeah I'm not sure. Maybe it's it would be easier if we have a kind of color palette in a theme, which is independent of the plugins. So because the JUnit plugin needs something to represent a green thing and a red thing, the warnings plugin needs it, the coverage plugin needs it, and maybe a different plugin needs it as well. So it makes not sense to have 10 different theme at uh, different color palettes it makes maybe sense to have one system color palette we uh, we do do that now yeah ah, um okay so i was just, just linking it to linking it here i'll just share my screen quickly just to yeah. demo um essentially say for these icons the screen is dependent on the theme that you use mm -hmm. um so if i try and go to dark mode quickly you'll see the green will actually change slightly it'll go brighter um, and the sun's disappeared for some reason. Um, if I reload, you'll also see the sun's also a slightly different color as well now. Um, so this is all possible to use um, in your plugins straight out of the box. And uh, is this just two colors or is it uh, because in a, when you're using a chart, you need more than yeah, three or four colors? Yeah, um, we have support for being six colors at the moment, but I plan to add probably okay. like an entire rainbow and more um, eventually. I've just been adding the colors that I've, I've been using um, for the icons and whatnot, but we'll have a, like a massive palette by the end of it, no doubt. Okay, that's fine. I'll stop sharing. So yeah, to be sure that that the the palette definition then is shifting into the the theme theming therefore 
Uli will eventually, or other, other things that are doing graphic rendering, will be able to get their color definitions from something that is theme aware? Yeah, yeah. So it's just calling the CSS variable. And so Tim's themes can override that easily. So they'll update kind of magically. Excellent, thank you. Tim or Jan, Jan anything else? Are you still working on the buttons PI, Jan, or any of the other? Yeah. Is there any other open ones? Um, it's just the buttons and breadcrumbs uh, right now. I think the breadcrumbs might just need one more review or something like that. Um, then the buttons just need the acceptance tests. Um, would you mind adding me to the to the branch for that, just so I can try and fix it or something? I'm yeah. not really sure. My understanding of the acceptance test is a bit limited, admittedly. Um, uh, buttons, yeah, I can add you to that. Yeah, and um, the unit test should be passing now. Um, they went a bit dodgy due to the weird merge that I did, but they should be fixed. Cool, I've added you. Yes. Um, and so your breadcrumbs is... Uh, breadcrumbs is, yeah, it's got three approvals. I'm not sure if Daniel, if you were planning to have another look, the combining of the separator was backed out. I mean, the combination was fine. I just didn't think it makes sense to add a new type to the hierarchy when it's more about the presentation. And I mean, I explained the reasons in the in the pull request. I haven't had a chance to take another look. I yeah, can, I think you definitely can. We just weren't we aren't, wasn't sure on how to get it working without that. I think mm -hmm. at the time. And Yuli suggested just backing it out for now to ship it and iterate it again. I can take another look. I think it makes sense. Sorry. I think I'll it makes sense. Look. Sorry. <laughs> Daniel, go. OK, I uh, just wanted to say I'll take another look. Thanks for the ping. I wanted to say I, I think we need some time to discuss the sidebar elements currently I think in much there are many too many things on the sidebar which should not be there and maybe we can define a new concept what is really shown on the sidebar and what not so we don't have 1000 plugins that can add an action on the left and yeah you don't see the important things anymore but this yeah, will need maybe. time Get, maybe getting rid of the sidebar in some places or collapsing it or or sections in the sidebar and hiding mm -hmm. things uh, mm -hmm. i mean to to some extent this is a problem with the extensible nature right because if we say well we only display things by default if they are an important action or something then obviously every plugin maintainer will say, yes, my plugin is definitely going to implement important action because it is very extremely important. And we have the same problem all over again, like three years down the road. Uh, the Git plugin is quite bad at this. I think it just attach, last time I noticed it attaches lots of build data, which becomes an action on the side. If you have interact with two or three Git repos, I think you end up with like three things on the left. I mean, there are strategies to, to address that. Mm. Certainly are. But maybe we can give some guidelines what is good and what is not good. And this is currently really missing. So when I started my warnings plugins, I also added a lot of uh, actions on the sidebar. But now I'm thinking hmm, maybe it would be better to have just one static analysis or even if it doesn't need on to be on the sidebar, it, maybe we need some totally different screen rendering. Yeah, I was hoping to look at that up. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay. Um, one of the things I was, I was kind of thinking of um, was kind of having plugins display as cards kind of on the build page. So for the static analysis warning, have a card for that. So 
instead of having an action, you just can see the card straight away, for example. Um, so there's less clicking involved and hopefully showing more on the build page because right now it can be a bit empty at times. Hmm. Yeah, I started that on the pipeline graph view plugin at some point. Somehow I lost my branch, <laughs> but like I, was, I started adding a bit of that where you'd have like tests and coverage and static analysis um, would just get added, would get like a section on the page or a tab or something. But I don't know what happened. I lost it in a stash or something. I don't know. Actually, I'm sure I wrote the code. Something we could look into could be um, that we show only some of the items. Now, there are few ways we could do that. I just mentioned the prominent or important action um, that would uh, always be, be displayed and the others are you kind of have to click on an element first before they're visible or something like that. The other option would be that users can configure the stuff they want uh, to see, which obviously means it's still a mess unless a user goes through the work of you know, customizing their thing, which is probably not a great default. And another might be that we um, could look into like, can we track the actions actually used by a user in some manner? Because we know when you click the, we can probably determine when you click the link um, to see an action and navigate there. Can we track that in your user profile? Obviously difficult, impossible with the anonymous user and feels a bit like brittle magic um, when people don't understand what's happening. But just off the top of my head, these might be strategies we could employ without entirely throwing away this part of the UI. I think we uh, presented a, a couple of months ago uh, one of the bachelor thesis uh, work of one of my students, where we had this uh, yeah, pull request monitoring plugin, which showed how we can use some kind of, of you know, drag and drop things to configure the screen. Maybe this is an approach as well. So maybe I show you the details. Uh, maybe it's easy. So, this is where the idea was that we have these uh, things where we can put these uh, elements here and we can, I think it was here, where we can use different portlets uh, and select the portlets. And what we did not manage was to say what is a, a good default, because everything is important for everybody, so it's really hard to find uh, yeah, which of these portlets are good or which should not be shown. So yeah, this takes a little bit time, I think, until we get this finished. <laughs> and then you get microservices and then you have 10, 20, 30 projects you're looking yeah. at. And then you don't care about individual, you just want an overall. Yeah. Are there other topics that we should be discussing here before we conclude? All right, I take the silence as a, it's okay. Thanks very, very much to everyone involved today. Thanks for the presentations, Uli, Jan, Tim. Thank you, thanks for your work on, on 2.335 and on all the ongoing things, uh, this is amazing. Thank you very much. A recording will be available of this within say the next 24 hours, I'll get it uploaded. Bye. Thanks all. Bye. Yes. Bye. Thank you, Mark. Bye. Bye.